Thank you everybody for joining today. We're happy to be here. We're happy you have joined us all. Uh, my name is MJ Carrion and I am the programs manager for AIA San Diego. And we're here today with Ben Rayner, who heads up the TAP committee and our panelist architect, Tommy Ross with Domo Studio and design director and senior associate at Gensler, Garrett Van Leeuwen. They have joined forces today to put, put, to, to put this program together for you. For those who don't know, AI San Diego is the chapter of the American Institute of Architects, headquartered in Washington, DC, and founded in 1857, and represents about 96,000 architects nationwide and representatives across the world. Our chapter was founded back in 1928, and we pride ourselves for professional excellence, integrity, community service, and lifelong learning. The local chapter is a professional association representing about 1,200 architects across all of San Diego County, and the organization is led by a diverse and volunteer board of directors, representing architectural firms of all shapes and sizes, from global firms to sole practitioners and everything in between, plus representatives from our local accredited schools of architecture, New School, and Woodbury. Again, thank you all for joining us today. This is a continuing education program. So if any of you do need credits, I am happy to report them. I'm gonna leave my email address on the chat. You can all email me your full name and AI number, and I can take care of that for you. So with no further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Ben. Great, thanks MJ. So um, yeah, I'm Ben Renier, and I will just get us started here. And uh, let me start by sharing my screen. So today's topic, uh, let's just make sure everyone can see it first. Is everyone seeing what I'm showing here? Yep. Great. So um, today's topic is real-time rendering. We're gonna cover, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on sort of less on necessarily on individual tools because we're trying to, we're not, we're not gonna be advocating for a single piece of software today. We're gonna talk through kind of workflows, how they get used, how different um, people are using them in real life practice situations. And before we really get into the discussion, um, I thought it might be worthwhile to, to reach out to the people in the, in the crowd and uh, see if anybody has any, uh, you can just toss this in the chat or if you want to speak up, you can. You know, th there's a lot of ways things get used. So, so are people using real-time rendering in their practice? And, and are you seeing this as a, as a need to change this, to, to adapt to some changing client expectations? And is there anything that you aren't doing that you wish you could? If anybody wants to speak up and get a couple of voices before we get started here, uh, if anybody has any, any big thoughts on this. Oops, are we allowed to talk too? You guys, you guys can talk, yeah. <laughs> um, renderings, I think, uh, you know, they cover the gamut of what we do. Um, anything from wowing a client to selling design to studying the design uh, three-dimensionally, obviously different qualities of rendering for those different deliverables. Um, but, you know, I think with the with the current technology, it's it's almost you know an everyday kind of thing where you're always looking at it in some kind of rendered form. Yeah, it, it has become sort of an all the time, mm -hmm. uh, nonstop situation uh, with visualization instead of outputting individual images on a on a calendar. It's sort of it's sort of uh, as you go, um, you know. And and I since we we got off a little bit late, I might just jump into introducing you guys, Garrett and Tommy, and, and also there's Nick, and we've also got a, a ghostly uh, presenter here that is currently wandering through, through some majestic beauty in the Sierras instead of uh, being on a Zoom call. I don't know why you picked that. Um, so uh, our experts today, uh, we, you, you just heard Garrett. Garrett's, uh, as, as MJ mentioned, design director and senior associate at Gensler. Um, and he works on a lot of uh, higher education and institutional projects, and he'll be presenting a few of those today. We've also got uh, Tommy here from Doma Studio, and he, also uh, Nick Wilson, who's part of our TAP committee. Um, and uh, they, they're uh, they've got had a they do a broad range of projects. You've probably seen a lot of their projects on um, in in the past. And uh, he is going to speak to a couple um, 
couple of tools that they use in their daily practice. Um, not here is Carl, uh, who is uh, works with Garrett and um, uh, brought a lot of uh, comments to the this this presentation, and we want to acknowledge his sort of his presence. But as I said, he is currently having a really good time uh, in in the woods where there's no Wi-Fi. And uh, just reintroducing myself again, I'm the uh, the tap chair. Um, Ben Renier, and uh, I am going to present one more slide, and then I'm going to shut up and let uh, let Tommy and Garrett and Nick talk. Um, so uh, let me move on to just a little introduction to the topic. So real-time rendering um, encompasses a suite of tools that instead of hitting a button and waiting for an image to show up, pr progressively render it or render it on your computer as you're viewing. It's just term real time. It comes out of game engines. As video game te technology got more sophisticated, they started being better at producing uh, semi-photorealistic images in real time. And this has really exploded in the last couple of years now that graphics cards have gotten better in the average computer, that there's currently many, many different bits of software that can, can do this. And people are using a lot of different workflows with it. Um, so it's a little overwhelming to somebody who's coming into it cold to try and figure out what they want to use. And so, you know, just to start this off, I wanted to acknowledge some of the tools that exist out there and some of the ways they're different. And then we're going to go through kind of four different tools that um, these two uh, practitioners use and talk through what the way they use them, the way that it's working for them, the way maybe some of the ways that it's not and uh, where they're going in the future with some of this stuff. So if you're thinking about it, some of the lenses you might use when you're thinking about these tools um, is what kind of features you need, how much complexity you want, and how much you want to spend. And just to kind of show you this little chart, you know, it, it's not, there's, not a, there's not a perfect solution out there. There's things that kind of can hit on a couple of axes, but nothing, there's not, we're not here to come and say, this is the best one, because that doesn't really um, exist. And it probably won't, because people are using these tools in such a broad array. So generally speaking, you've got a lot of tools that are really full featured and feature rich, um, like Twin Motion and Lumion. And then there's some some tools that are more aimed at uh, maybe the construction industry like Fuser or Omniverse. Um, and but, you know, they uh, maybe are a little have a slightly steeper learning curve and there's a cost associated with associated with associated with them. There's also Enscape, which is somewhat different from these in that it's um, it works out of a plugin. It's a little maybe a little more plug and play, perhaps slightly less control over the end visualization than some of these other tools, but it comes with a much simpler workflow uh, as a result. And then off to the side over here, you've got kind of the originating engines behind this, which uh, Unreal and Unity, which are the original game engines, incredibly feature rich. You can do almost anything with them, including create a video game. They're actually free to use. However, that also comes with a really steep learning curve and perhaps a workflow that's not optimized for architects. Also doesn't come up with some of the like helper stuff like entourage, like trees and people and cars. You kind of have to source that stuff yourself. And so that's at the other end where it's, you know, the, the cost of the user is very low but uh, the amount of sort of assistance or, 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 or templating that comes with the tool is, is also fairly minimal. And so we'll be talking through, uh, I think Garrett's gonna speak to Enscape and Lumion a little bit, and then Tommy and Nick are gonna talk through Unreal and Twin Motion because Twin Motion is actually built on top of Unreal as an architect centric um, sort of workbench for that engine. So um, I am now going to try and be quiet which everyone that knows me knows is very difficult for me. And I'm going to hand it over uh, to Garrett. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I've got this pic picnic napkin on my face, so hope, hope nobody minds that. Um, so a little bit just about rendering. I think, you know, there's, as, as we talked about in the beginning, like many uses f for it. I think the the most powerful is when it can be used to, really create an emotional connection with the client, with prospective occupants of the space. And um, and I think in terms of what that does, I mean, that's obviously any rendering can, can do that, any engine can do that. And it's ultimately up to the person who's working on the design uh, to help craft the, the visual that, that will best do that. Um, and I, I, what, in the case of Lumion, we use this, uh, in, on the stadium project for a number of reasons. Um, 
one, it allowed us the ability to bring in a separate Revit model, Rhino model, and SketchUp models all into one kind of host environment in the Lumion software. So Lumion's a standalone software, it's not a plugin. You need to export models. Um, they can, it, it can accept any number of formats, but, and you can actually link them in. So what we were able to do here was create an early environment with like a site SketchUp model, and then link in, uh, link in that SketchUp model, link in Revit, link in Rhino. And then as that geometry and design gets more detailed over time, and then we could add in, you add in trees, cars, people, lighting, all of that in that Lumion model. And it, you can kind of add more detail to the scenes as the models get developed and the design gets developed. Um, so it was kind of this living um, tool that we were able to use. Um, we used it earlier on when things weren't as developed to show to the client for client approval and design charrettes. And then ultimately use that same model when the client requests that we have renderings that go out to the public, they get published on their website or go in the newspaper or anything like this because it's obviously a high profile project. And we're able to use that kind of same base uh, for, all, for all of those things, which made it um, very useful and, and kind of invaluable. And then we, we need to, we can obviously still go back to that. Um, the, in Lumion, you can animate people, you can animate cameras, you can obviously do fly-throughs. It has some of that uh, video game kind of capability that, that Ben talked about. Um, another thing that we liked about it is that it has a pretty high production value in terms of, like there, there's ways of like setting some of the still images and applying almost post-production effects, like Photoshop-like effects to the scenes before they even get exported. So in some cases, you know, the little to no Photoshop needed in some cases, um, which, which is a nice thing in, in terms of like saving time. Um, so I, we, we, we generally use Photoshop because always kind of adding finishing touches in there when we're finishing up renderings. But uh, at Carl, which is, uh, you know, Ben mentioned earlier on our team, he was really kind of integral in developing that workflow where we were able to kind of build upon things and link in models into this single environment. And would you say that, so the kind of the way that it worked as a team is that there were people working on designs in multiple platforms. And then uh, in this case, it was Carl was sort of the, the aggregator into the the so into the, into the visuals software. basically yeah exactly right so we, we had a, you know, on a large project like this where you have a team yeah one or two people working on just the structural model for the for the stadium uh one person working on one or two people working on the site design the, and the surrounding buildings and all that can be continuously worked on and then okay carl hey it's updated he really like updates the link and then all that stuff can now show up while he's in there um, adding, adding trees and people and material detail and all that kind of stuff. That's great. Um, anything else you want to say to this? I think that we, to the, the, one of the things we're seeing come out of this type of tool in general and where in Omniverse, which is one of those we're not actually going to talk about because it's brand new is speaking is kind of aimed at explicitly is the idea of having a, a shared visualization environment uh, that people can toss their work into, um, and actually, that's it's a sort of it's muddying one of the one of the like industry terms that has very little actual rigid definition right now in technology is digital twin, and I'm I'm seeing more and more companies that actually make rendering tools pivoting to calling them digital twins, which is interesting. And I don't think it's inaccurate because the tool, the, the name of the, the that that term doesn't have a solid definition. But it, it's a totally different thing than like something that shows where are you all, where all your air handlers are, which is sort right. of where that came from. It's now kind of a shared source of truth for the way the project looks and is experienced, which is a totally different idea, but also I think really valid and interesting. And, and this approaches that. Uh, cool. I mean, that we're running into that on this project right now as it's under construction. So we we did all these great renderings but we didn't show all the conduit that's going in there. <laughs> and so we're, you know, and you can imagine how much of that there is. And 
Um, it seems like increasingly more amounts with the more technology we put in our buildings these days. So yeah, having something that was able to do that when like later in the game, I, I think there would be value in that too. Yeah, bringing visualization through construction, which we're yeah. seeing increasingly. I, yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go to the next case study. Um, if I can get this thing to listen to me, there you go. So talk about this project, Garrett. Yeah, so uh, this is a student union on a community college campus down at Chula Vista. Um, this particular project is started, went from like sketch form um, and we did our programming via basically two-dimensional graphics in Revit and built our Revit model from scratch. And we have, as an office, been trying to start doing that because um, what we found was kind of cumbersome and or very inefficient is when, let's say, the project gets designed and started in SketchUp and then there's this kind of transfer phase where things go from SketchUp into Revit to create the drawings. And instead we wanted to challenge ourselves and start with everything uh, you know, from scratch in Revit. And so that's what we did. And we used Enscape from the beginning to do that. And what you see in the upper part of the uh, image there is, since Enscape is a, is a plug into Revit, you could, in earlier parts of the project, we, we call them white models. You can turn off all the materiality assignments and just basically paint everything white and before you have maybe material decisions, even as a part of the design discussion. And you're just thinking about volumes and massing. And it's able to do that, still picking up transparency. So you can realize what, you know, what's glass versus what's solid. Um, and actually the detail in that particular image at the top of the screen is probably more detailed than when we even originally started it, where it was really just blocking um, and, and different types of mass. But we were able to kind of stay in that realm with the client for a while and get to the point where they're really engaged in buying off on the volume of the space and how the space is being laid out and how, how tall things are and what the arrangements are. And, um, and then eventually be able to build up material assignments using Revit and having all that translate into you know, the Enscape visual when you're opening that around. What's great about this is since Enscape can render real time, albeit it, you know, it does slow down your computer a little bit if it's got live updates, but you could be adding content to the Revit model, um, drawing, updating the model, and your your Enscape can be off on your other screen, updating on the fly as you're going. So as a design tool, integrating that into Revit, all of a sudden now you have the 3D uh, visibility like SketchUp, but you're building it in Revit where you have your, your drawings and everything living. So that was always a down draw, I think, of early Revit users when you're trying to design and look at something in 3D, the 3D interface uh, in perspective view especially was never great, but Enscape has kind of changed that now because you can immediately evaluate and look at things in 3D uh, a lot more fluidly than, than what was previously done with just Revit. Yeah. So the two things I want to pull out of that, um to remember for maybe a later discussion that we did, we talked about actually when we were all kind of prepping for this is one, the idea that real-time rendering is not just a presentation tool, it becomes rapidly becomes a design tool where you're mm -hmm. doing little back checks because you can get something that's fairly, shows light in a better way and maybe materiality in a better way as you're going and it allows you to do very quick evaluations. And then the other thing here that you, you, you you touched on is the idea that since you jump into a certain kind of um, more approaching more realism earlier in the project, there are actually new techniques that have to get developed that allow you to pull back layers of detail so you're not mm -hmm. distracting your client or your team with unnecessary, basically garbage information early on. Like before you've applied materials, you don't want to have those materials shown because somebody might actually be responding Using to that it with something else or yeah if it's yeah. just too dark it could be that that's what the yeah the first response is to if you're not if you you know don't know the ins and outs of default materials in a software um yeah so yeah. That, that that's been helpful um but i i I'll, what i really like about enscape is just just the the <laughs> the simple mousing and kind of flow through it it's it's really intuitive and easy to do in Revit. I just remember when you try to set up a camera in Revit, you, you could never really study something that well. Um, yeah. 
So, and, but Revit does have a great material editor in like native in it. And mm -hmm. so in, in Enscape uses that. So you're able to control all of that in your Revit model. Yeah, and um, just to mention, so like the some of the features that we're talking about, that plugin, they, they, they've gone the full plugin route, right? And so yeah. they have plugins for SketchUp and Rhino actually, and that, and that can get us, I, we, we've had problems on other projects where we're, we're modeling in multiple softwares and we're using Enscape to visualize for all three of them and the client doesn't realize that they're separate models. And then they start asking why stuff's not showing up in certain presentations. And mm -hmm. since you can't really federate it the way you can with ones that are where you're exporting geometry, mm -hmm. <laughs> it becomes a very awkward conversation to say, well, that's another model. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, I think that's interesting that the visual uh, expression of the model becomes something that's handled by a separate platform and it's right. a shared platform. And I think that's kind of cool. Um, I, the, the plugin strategy is, I think that there's sort of a, a UI intent difference between export and plugin. And some people, I think that, um, for instance, Twinmotion is actually, I think, trying to give you the option of like where, where you can stream information in so you can kind of get a similar effect because they're trying to kind of be in both places at once. But like, that's mm -hmm. something to look at. And really, if you're trying to figure out what you want to use, there, it's not, one of those is not necessarily better than the other. But depending on how you use the tool, you might want it to be one way or the other. And so it's something to kind of play. If you're getting demos, you're playing around with something, it's something to think about that that aspect of the workflow. Is it something that you want to have sitting on top of your design software so you're always working through your design software, slowing that down, having those effects? Mm -hmm. Or is it something where you want to export, which is a little more, you know, mm -hmm. it's not as real time, but it does give you a separate program. Yeah, if your team's big enough, then you yeah. can have, yeah. And that gives you the op opportunity to do what you guys did on the with mm -hmm. Lumion, which is combine all sorts of mm -hmm. authoring geometry into a single shared visualization model, which is mm -hmm. super powerful and really, really neat. Um, okay, so let's uh, jump over to, uh, to, to Tommy and um, so let's see where we are. Next thing we're going to talk about is a Unreal Engine. So go ahead, Tommy. So I guess um, on the other end of the spectrum is Unreal Engine. It's effectively the, the motor that drives all these other softwares, which is fantastic if you're patient. It is not the greatest if you're under the gun, um, but ultimately what it does, this, this is built as was previously stated for video game engine design, um, which Basically, the extent of your programming knowledge is the extent that you can take this to the freedom of your design. Um, one of the discussions we were having is how most of these photos need to be post-processed to deliver to a client. Um, the integrity of your model in Unreal can eliminate all that depending on how extensive you invest in it. So for an example, just looking at these three renderings here, these are all screen grabs that we just pulled out of fly-throughs. Um, and for the most part, the geometry is predominantly produced in Revit. You can do higher fidelity models in something also free like Blender. Um, and I guess, again, it's, it's what you're looking for in your engine and what you're trying to produce. Um, these ones we started going for photorealism just to draw in, as Garrett was talking about, that emotional draw to these, these scenes, these architectures, to these moments. But on the other end of the spectrum, you can produce these without material integrity, fidelity, and simplify to a white model just as a background-based study for spaces. In-house, we've had that experience. Uh, this is kind of where we bridge between Unreal Engine and Twin Motion, where Twin motion is as though somebody was using Unreal Engine in architecture and said, get rid of all the other tools. We just need to be able to import models and give us a quick means to run through. Um, Nick, if you want to jump in on that, just in terms of the difference in usability, immediate usability for the learning curve. Sure. So really... Twin motion, our experience here in the office uh, started with Tommy uh, sitting in his corner, being a master at Unreal Engine and producing beautiful fly throughs and, and all of this great imagery. And for us, it was twin motion was uh, kind of that bridge 
to be user friendly for the remainder of the office. Uh, it, to use Tommy's analogy of uh, that literally Unreal Engine is the motor that drives all of these programs. Twin Motion is basically applying uh, traction control to that engine and making it user friendly for for uh, the kind of typical architect. Um, and, and that's that's really how we started utilizing Twin Motion uh, in our office. Was we had a uh, we had a project that was uh, midway through CDs. We had already produced a, a rendering package, so just a still image rendering package in our traditional way here, uh, which was utilizing the Revit rendering process. And uh, we wanted to produce a fly through for a community meeting that uh, popped up uh, for this client. And uh, I attempted to utilize Unreal uh, to, to do that fly through and I failed. It was, it was overwhelming and I did not have the time to sit down and figure it out. And somebody in the office had a suggestion, why don't we try a twin motion? And it's pretty incredible that within a week, uh, multiple of us were able to pick it, pick it up and run with it. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see some uh, images from that, that first week's worth of attempt. Um, and since then, uh, we've taken uh, the program and utilized it more in terms of uh, a, a workflow flow from the very beginning. So utilizing it for massing models early on. Uh, animations have become, and fly-throughs have become something that we use as an internal design tool, not just as a deliverable to clients. I, I think that speaks to the uh, how easy it is and efficient it is timing wise to produce some of these fly throughs. Uh, it's no longer just strictly a deliverable. Um, but similar to some of the other programs we talked about earlier, Twin Motion comes with a library of entourage trees, cars, people. Uh, you add your own lighting within the program. Uh, but again, uh, extremely user friendly. And uh, the images you see here were all modeled exclusively in Revit and processed in twin motion with no Photoshop post-processing applied whatsoever. Uh, just, just very straightforward and it gives the, gives the client uh, a unique visual to be able to uh, utilize those fly-throughs um, at, uh, at a reasonable cost and something that maybe they didn't think that was a realistic uh, deliverable for them to utilize. So in our experience here for these church clients, uh, being able to provide them with a fly through for the community, for the, the neighborhoods around these churches uh, has been a, a great, great asset for them. And I think these projects show off some of the reasons you might want to consider how, why these tools are useful, because the difference between a, um, a nice view out of like a, with, with textures applied, but not necessarily going through a rendering engine um, and something that you do put through an official rendering engine is 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 sort of um, I don't know if you call them atmospherics. I would say that like it's soft shadows, reflections, entourage that has a, like an actual more like model level of transparency to it. Um, so the way that you're kind of seeing starting to see stuff the building through the trees and the way that you're getting um, some reflected light in the, on the underside of this, the fact that this is like a white building really kind of shows off some of that stuff. And the, the trick is that this isn't, there's like three levels, right? You have out of the box views of the model. You've got stuff that goes through this, which is um, using a lot of shortcuts to approach photorealism, but it's not necessarily, it's not ray tracing. It's not a literal model, uh, not a, a literal physically rendered, rendered model. Um, and then, you know, we have clients that kind of, where we're at this level that then expect us to go all the way to true photorealism. And that's actually, you still have, you have to, then you have to go into like an entirely different workflow because it becomes so complicated to make sure that all your materials are actually realistic in the way that they're reflecting light. And, and you have to, have to start ray tracing things to make sure that your bounce light is accurate to the space. Cause there's some, there's always shortcuts that these things take that might not make things true to true photorealism they're just they look right and they'll feel right right so 
Ben, to Thank kind you. of speak to that. That's actually another one of the big draws, but also one of the big complexities with Unreal Engine is I'm sure anybody that's done any of the research on it, they've seen the live walkthroughs in Unreal Engine and it is taking into account those items. And that's where you start with this program and it feels like you're jumping blind into 3DS Max for the first time because all those things are available. It's just, it's, it's completely open-ended. It's anarchy. You're free to do anything you want. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I, it's, uh, I, I think it's, and it's the really interesting thing to me is that um, you guys saw the value in moving to Twin Motion from Unreal when it's essentially the same engine underneath. And what you're paying for is actually, in a way, fewer tools or uh, you know, tools that have been uh, narrowed down curated. on programmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's like they you're paying for the dashboard essentially. But I guess you know it's hard to drive a car without one. So um it makes makes sense that you'd want to purchase that, but it's it, what, what, the fascinating thing is that because we're getting the architecture industry is getting the inheritance from the game industry, which has a ton of money behind it, right? It's the new Hollywood, and so they're pouring all this money into technology that, in order to get developers, game developers, to use it, they're giving away these engines for free because that comes back to them in a tangible way, and so we're able to sort of sidechain some of that stuff and say, well, the, you know, we can adapt this to our use. And it's creating a whole kind of secondary industry on top of it, which is which is pretty fascinating. Um, and while Unreal is not necessarily, I don't think they give a wit about um, architects. Twin, the people who make Twin Mission do, the people who make Enscape do, the people who make Lumion do. They'll, they they speak our language a little more, and so they're kind of helping make uh, make us hit deadlines quicker by by providing a more focused workflow to the to the to this engine that we're getting for free. Yeah, that's, that's... one of the things I've noticed and appreciate about Unreal Engine is their attempt to draw in architects. They've got learning tools all free online. They've got templates that are started with the intent of architect use. And I've been using it for years and it's still unapproachable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you want to be able to, you know, I don't know, blow your building up at the end, um, You've, you've you can got to use. That. You only can use Unreal. I don't think that any of these other tools provide that feature. Well, and actually, I would <laughs> say that's kind of part of where I think the tools are still all keeping up with each other. I'm not sure where they're at with the other softwares, but the continual one is VR integration and collaboration. And I know that those tools are there. I think they're also there in the other softwares. And I think that's where it starts getting to be more applicable every day with your client interface. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it starts bringing everybody into a space instead of just leaving it to the imagination. Yeah, there's, um, I think some of those features include, and this is different for every tool, a different workflow, slightly different feature set. So to speak, generali generalizing it, there's VR workflows that let you put on a headset, there's ones that'll let you kind of publish a visualization model to a website or as a mm -hmm. standalone file so that your client can open them or look at them on their computer without you being there, which is great sometimes, maybe not great all the time, uh, depends on the client. Um, and then there are tools that actually try to provide an environment where people can jump into a model together, mm -hmm. um, almost like zoom through your model. And that's, that's a little farther uh, afield. But that's a, that's there's several companies that um, that are really explicitly focused around that kind of collaborative in the model environment, um, and I, you know I think that that's still that's probably on the adoption curve. That's at the at the other end from this, which is just trying to get a quick, re, you know, realistic imagery to your client and allow that feedback loop to shorten. Um, I'm going to open up to questions in 10, five, 10 minutes, but I wanted to ask both um, Garrett, you and Tommy um, and Nick, how the introduction of these tools has changed the way that you provide visualizations to your clients. What are they asking for? Um, if you want to share how you're like, 
how it's working its way into your fees, I think that would be appropriate as well. Mm -hmm. um, but if you guys want to talk to how that's changed in the last five years, that would be, I think that would be a good way to, to, to finish up the formal. I mean, five years, I think recently I was looking at a project that we did renderings for in that time frame, and I was kind of like almost shocked um, just at what, what was kind of standard practice at the time. Now, I'm not talking professional, but just kind of the ones that are off the cuff during, you know, working meetings that you would share with the client and the quality. Um, you know, I think it's a, this, this whole technology presents a little bit of a challenge because like you guys said, the, the technology was developed for a video game uh, industry, which is a totally different business model than what architects do. And so we got to find a way to make, make this have enough value that it, we get compensated for the effort that goes into it. And um, I, I think there's there's a fine line there. I think we, I think it's really comes down to the team, the architects that are managing the team um, to kind of d develop your own thresholds for what is part of, you know, your, your standard set of services and what is more, more than that. Um, you know, I, ben and I were talking the other day, I think when, you know, when a client comes to you and specifically asks for a, a rendered view for their, their personal needs, when I say personal, their business needs, or they need to go take that view, they need to go show it to other people, whether for sales, for marketing, or for whatever. And there's a level of critique and scrutiny that's going to go on in that process. That, that seems to warrant, you know, above what is above and beyond kind of the anything that would be developed as part of the design process. Um, however, I mean, it's, it's obviously a case by case basis, you know, and on the other hand, you know, I, I know on the stadium, we were really interested. We've got so many different team members and so many different things from lighting to signage and graphics to landscape that we, we, you know, the design team wanted a way to just visualize all these things together and so just to know and be able to feel comfortable with how the design was shaping up and having all of this kind of broad consultant group kind of come together. So Lumion was able to do that for us. It just so happened that the image that were spitted out were pretty high quality. And we were able to do that without having to, you know, either hire an outside firm or, um, uh, you know, or consider it, you know, too much. But at some point, the well starts running dry and the client's like, okay, have another one, have another one. And that there's a, there's a challenge there. So, um, and you know, now we're at the point where it's under construction. If you still want to run a review, it's going to cost you, man, you know, so <laughs> um, yeah, that's an, that's an ongoing thing. I, it's going to evolve, I would imagine even more as, because technology seems to kind of keep doubling up and improving on itself. So um yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be something we have to continue to to chase, I suppose. Yeah, that's the the combination of them seeing it as an easy button and and that it's we're not putting yeah. any effort into it, which is untrue. Right. <laughs> it's like the, there's that Les Paul, uh, like I think it's probably an apocryphal story, but somebody telling him his guitar sounded great, and he put it on the stand, and he said, "Well, how does it sound now?" Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, the and then there's the idea that once they realize that they can get quick turnaround on small changes, like we have to be able to convey that we need to charge them for the time of getting feedback and incorporating it. Um, right, right. Which when it when the loop on asking for something and getting it's a week, there's a, already a filter to that. Um, but if it's an hour, then then they can, oh, can I get on one more thing? What about this angle? Can we, can we change that person's shirt color? You know, like it gets, it becomes <laughs> endless and there has to yeah. be a way of, like there's value to them for that. Like that's valuable to the client. So they should, we should be able to right. uh, capitalize on that value. And, and it's, I think we're still figuring kind of that out a little bit. Tommy, do you have anything, um, do you want to, anything to say on that, on that kind of general topic about how we relate with clients? Yeah, uh, I pretty much agree on all of that. Um, I think predominantly, you know, in our experience, in our practice, we tend to use it as a design tool to just kind of validate the integrity of the design to really confirm what we're thinking is what we're producing. Again, it's tied with the pipeline of Revit. It's ideally something that you pump 
from one system to the other directly. So you're not burning time just trying to make something pretty. You're making it pretty because it's actually proper in your design documentation. So it's the hardest part about doing these visualizations is it's it's the design that matters, you know? Right. Right. How much are you gonna mask and how much are you gonna hide? How much of that do you have to do if you've just genuinely got a good design? But or have it all figured part, out and built right and you're not yeah. missing parts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, I think that's that's the big challenge, but ultimately, you know, you talk contracts, it's great to take it to the client and share it with them. It helps sell a design, especially if you're trying to take liberties, if you're trying to push something that's not going to convey too simply on, on a drawing, on a sheet of paper. To, to fly them through a space is phenomenally simpler to explain mm -hmm. majority of the time. But yeah. you got to be clear, it's like, this is just our tool to convey it to you. If you want it, it's an, it's an ad service. Because <laughs> we're, we're going to give you something something more than you know it's not in the contract and I know you're going to ask for some changes yeah mm -hmm. yeah well, one, thing I, one thing I'd like ahead. to add to what to what Tommy just said about he was making the point about the our workflow from Revit directly to these programs back and forth is that we're also showing the client something that's accurate we're showing them what we are actually drawing in terms of uh, what will ultimately be in the construction documents and where the design really is, it's not just a representation of the design. Um, it, it's it's the, the true reflection of the building as it's being been designed up until that point. So we're, we're showing them the real thing. We're not showing them something that looks pretty so we get signed off and then we change it in CDs. And there are some, some pushbacks into Revit from that try like you spend a little more time on handrails than you would spend if you were just doing 2D uh, uh, drawings and and yeah, you know exactly you, you gotta you got there is a little bit this is where the thing you have to say, explain to them this isn't this isn't an easy button situation this isn't magic we're not waving our hands and it's magically visualizing there's work that goes into this and you guys need to appreciate that and then there's like the expectation I like what you said about there's value to the design team in terms of sort of accelerated or smoothed approvals from the client because they will have they might have more questions up front but they will get through those questions faster and there's less opportunity assuming you're doing a good job of like visualizing the model as it is of bad surprises later in the game you're actually kind of giving them an earlier preview and then that's that has that has makes it more efficient for us so there is some back end efficiency uh advantages as well. And I, I really, you mentioned on an earlier conversation, the anecdote about this little patch right here, which is that you had to add this, this paving in here because this was previously on campus. It was donated by uh, a parishioner and, and it had to, you had to show that it was going to be there. And that, that level of like attention to detail is critical when you're like flying somebody through something, all that stuff, the like right pavers in the parking lot become actually part of the design. And, and that level of attention to detail does is goes beyond where we used to go with some of our visualizations and, and strategies previously. And I think that's another thing you need to acknowledge is there's some work that has benefits, but it also is its work. And, you know, it's, it's, it's time you have to put into something you didn't put time into previously. Um, okay. So. And, it, and it avoids the question of, you're not tearing out my papers, are you? Yeah, exactly. They're right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's best to wait for them to ask that question and then turn the camera and reveal. No, they're right there. See? Yes. Um, that's a great, uh, to be able to respond in real time to show them the answer is always feels like a, like a really great gotcha where the client yeah. all of a sudden realizes the value of having an architect with these skills on board. Um, cool. So we got 15 minutes left. I wanted to open it up to the group. I got a little board here. I can keep people's questions up. And uh, if you want to, um, if anybody, I think we can, we got a small enough group here at the couple dozen that we can, people can just kind of unmute and ask a question. We don't need to go through a, um, uh, a, a, a formal Q&A thing. I do have one question from Jana uh, Vanolia, I hope I pronounced your name right, says on case study three for the, uh, the guy's library, um, to work with the lighting designer on the specification, they perform photometric studies and get 3D the lighting levels. How do these photometric studies get translated to renderings to present to clients? Um, 
I've got an answer for this, which is my standard answer, but uh, I want to get Tommy answer it too. I'm going to say real quick, the renderings that that our lighting designers provide are the only source for accurate information about precise light levels coming from fixtures. And it's sort of up to us to make sure that the approximations we're showing in the real-time images show mm -hmm. something similar to that. Yeah, but we're but never going to get there. Yeah. And this is actually a, uh, a really good point um, because the software that they use, every time I hear a lighting designer talk about that, they complain about how heavy and difficult their software is to use. And so it makes you <laughs> makes you wonder, is there gotta, there's got to be some way where those two things can start to work better and talk to each other so it's a little bit more accurate. But um, a lot of times what we've done is, you know, we'll take a lead and say, we think it should be lit like this. And we use the renderings to kind of talk about it. <laughs> sometimes if they, you have a good designer, they like that. If you have a, yeah. sometimes you have people that don't like it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. landscape too, that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tommy, you got anything to say to it? Uh, yeah, I do know. What are the photometric files? Are they IAS files? Yep. Uh, so yeah. I'm pretty sure, well, I know that Unreal Engine has the lighting tools. You can plug in the IAS, which is accurate. I'm not sure, I don't know. I'm not a lighting designer. I don't know the fidelity of it, but I know that they're trying to emulate it. I know they're trying to get close so that it becomes another usable tool for architects, but yeah, at the same time, you're still working within a rendering engine and it depends on your actual exposure and your camera and all of those, call it photometrics, besides just the lighting fixtures. What's your outside levels? What's your inside levels? What's the yeah. reflectivity in your materials? You get to that level, you've got a good set of 100% documents. But... Yeah, I was just going to say, Thomas, I mean, that's like... It that's got to be reflective of where you are in the project. A lot yeah, of times exactly. when we're producing the renderings that are part of the design process, it's earlier in the project and we're trying to get a tent, intent uh, kind of bought in across the whole team, client team, consultant team and all that. And so we don't, we need those light level photometrics, you know, at that point in time. But it would be great if there was a way to kind of build upon that towards when you get closer to CDs and you can have a dedicated meeting like, oh, we're talking about light levels, here's some views. These are accurate to, you know, the light levels you're going to get. And um, I mean, it's kind of an ideal thing. Yeah, right? I think it's compounded by the fact that cameras and eyes actually see light differently. And you get <laughs> pe people's visual like systems can can pers can work with much higher levels of contrast and still be comfortable than what looks in a camera might look in a yeah. photograph like really contrasty and you can see that all the time like the way you experience this space versus when you try to take a picture with your phone and you're like well it doesn't look like i think it looks not yeah. to mention um, everything is just pixels on a screen <laughs> right, so. that's a problem too <laughs> well and and just i guess to i'll speak again to unreal engine i know that from a programmer's outlook if you have a lighting designer they can probably get the fidelity pretty close at a certain point though with the tools that are available um but again i think this is an aia we don't need lighting designers <laughs> well, just kidding just kidding just kidding i'm still taking any any lighting strong design. statement there just All kidding right. going in the minutes <laughs> um, i will pretend that i didn't hear that okay <laughs> Um, the, I think that there's, a, the, to wrap that up, I think that this gives us a lot of opportunity to, per, like, I, one of the things you get with these rendering tools is a more accurate, although not, you know, approach to what light feels like in a space that, you know, we're selling design, right? And, and this gives us, so many times we work with those channels that are like not something that's easy to convey in a drawing or an image, right? We work with the kind of like the feel of a space or the quality of light, things that are, are more ephemeral. And we tend to use those all the time, use reflectivity and, and translucency and stuff, stuff that's like really hard to actually like not, like you'll, you'll know what it looks like when you walk in the space, right? That kind of stuff. And this gives us a way to get a little bit closer, which is like, this is value that the design team is adding, right? We're the only people that can, can get that kind of like make a promise with a rendering and say it is going to feel like that, but it takes the team, the team has to be intelligent in how they utilize the tools. And um, 
yeah and 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 i think that some of the stuff working with ies files and 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 going back and forth between a, a ray tracer and real time to make sure that you're staying honest i think that all of that's important that it's not it's not there's no once again no easy button it's, it's the skill of the team well and again i think also that's just the value of the tool for communication with clients and with your design team if you're able to give a feel of a space to your lighting designer to your engineers you have something that they can work off of mm -hmm. a little bit with a little bit more precision to at least what you're explaining great um any other anybody else uh want to raise their hand any other questions for the for the experts in the room i know somebody has a question come on maybe i'll ask you guys some questions if, if we can't get anybody to volunteer um i wanted to ask about specifically about entourage how do you guys what do you feel about people and cars and trees. How does that change with these programs? And how does it? What, what do you? What, what do you? What do you want to see? And what do you have? Can I speak to Twin Motion real quick? Yeah. <laughs> so Twin Motion is incredible with trees, with cars. It's impressive with people, but being with the roots of it, if it being a video game engine, the people look like they're from a video game and an old video game, I should say. And, uh, but you use that. I, I think that's part of the skill of utilizing any of these programs is understanding the, their limits. And, uh, maybe if you're, if you're trying to prevent any sort of, uh, post-processing in Photoshop, you can utilize the entourage, like for the, the people within twin motion, uh, in the distance, and then you Photoshop in, or you just keep them in the, in the distance. Uh, then if you do want to have people in the foreground, maybe you utilize Photoshop at that point to add uh, people with, that are much more realistic and, and impressive from a visual standpoint. Uh, but uh, here, but the, these are 3D and this person's Photoshop because if you get that close up to some of these people, you might not like what you see. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And uh, the, the other thing that's interesting with Twin Motion, and I, I can't speak to some of the other programs about this, but you can there are animations and the ability to uh, activate people and cars uh, within the program. So you can have somebody that is, you basically set a walking path. So let's say, for example, you're doing an animation, you want to do a pan across the site and you want to show people walking along a boardwalk or something, some sort of scene like that. Uh, the people can be animated and the animation is actually uh, pretty good um, with the exception, again, the, Facial expressions seem to seem to be the weak point. So again, you use your skill. You have somebody that's walking on a path, but you just look at them from behind and you see their movement across the site. It conveys the 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 scene and the emotion of the, of being in that environment without throwing you off and remembering that you're in a video game engine. Uh, so I think it, I think it comes down to the way you utilize the tools. Yeah. And I, I noticed one feature that a bunch of these companies have added in the last couple of years is subtly animating the trees so that they kind of wiggle a little bit while you're standing there. <laughs> and that sounds like a gimmick. And then you see it happening and you, you it, it does, it, it, even if you have a still view, having those things just kind of rustle a little bit changes the way that your brain sees the image and mm -hmm. has a real tangible impact. It's really weird. Absolutely. Um, there's, also, uh, there's also weather in twin motion. So again, your comment about the trees sparked that thought, which is you can assign, you know, it not just cloudy versus sunny, but you can assign rain or snow and whatnot. And you can see the way that the environment reacts with water hitting those trees and and water hitting the site and everything. It, it it's pretty entertaining at least. <laughs> and very practical for San Diego. Have it snow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I would say that those add, I'm going to put adding emotion into the, the little note here, because I feel like that is, um, you know, the when you get into the, the magazine quality renderings, I feel like one of the things that the renderers always do is they add that hint of motion through like the movement of a curtain or something like that, mm -hmm. that um, that's, that's like a, it's a cheap trick, but it's a really 
smart cheap trick that makes makes it seem more real to people. And I feel like what we're seeing is the automation of some of that stuff. And another thing we talked about actually was one of the tools that we don't use as architects that's all over Unreal is these kind of dirt and grime packs where you're, you like, you say, I want this to look a hundred years old and it goes boop and it like wears down all the corners and it adds cracks to the concrete and video games use that constantly because they're always creating atmospheres and usually it's a decaying space station or it's a you know post-apocalyptic wasteland and so those things are necessary you got to agreeable everything um, but we haven't actually started using any of that we want everything to look fresh and new and perfect and i i, I kind of wonder if we're going to start pulling some of that stuff in just because it's there later on i'm interested in concrete yeah yeah i mean concrete cracks gotta show the cracks <laughs> Yeah. One limitation with some of these programs, and uh, at least on Twin Motion side, is that you do have a great library of trees, bushes, different plantings, uh, but there's always that one plant species that <laughs> is important for the project that you can't, that's not in the library, and it it becomes very frustrating at that point. There, there's workarounds where you can try to find a 3D model and, and utilize it, you know, via Revit, um, but you're you're sacrificing that same movement and whatnot that is associated with the the plant components that are built into the program's library. So there are limitations, but they're they're working on those. Yeah, I I'm still in the world on my projects in the world of doing the photo, doing the real time renderings, and then shifting over to a Photoshop from the landscape architect that shows the actual species. When, when, when they start asking those questions. And that's clearly, we're not there yet. But um, I think that when these guys pivot to, set, to, to aiming at the, um, the landscape architect community more precisely, maybe we'll start to see some more of that stuff. I don't know, it's tricky. Uh, uh, it looks like we got one minute left. If anybody has a burning question they wanted to raise, it looks like uh, people are, are getting off their lunch hour. So I wanna, I don't wanna, Hold anybody else, any of our presenters, uh, away from their 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 billable hours because they're they're very <laughs> valuable people. Um, so uh, one last chance for anybody to ask a question, and uh, if not, we'll uh, love to thank you guys. Um, and uh, and I, I learned a lot today from you guys. I love hearing about how people use tools, and uh, I can't wait to have another one of these presentations. So thank you guys. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye.